At this point in time, um, well, <clears throat> did, did anybody notice anything that was like out in the parking lot? It was kind of shiny. I swear it was brand spanking new, had four tires. All right, all right. Well, <clears throat> that car was generously donated by Jim Shorkey Mitsubishi. And representing them tonight is Todd Holland. Todd, I'd like if you could come up and say a few words. And we need to thank them. Hi, everybody, and uh, congratulations to the athletes. More importantly, congratulations to the parents. Uh, you guys obviously raised extremely intelligent, hardworking, uh, young people, which is what makes the world go round in the future. So my deepest of congratulations goes out to you again. It is it's because of you that we're able to be here. As far as the athletes go, good luck to one of you. Uh, there is a 2019 Mitsubishi Mirage G4 sitting out there waiting for one of you. And uh, best of luck to all of you. Thank you. All right. Oh, here comes the best part. You know, if they would have named dessert dinner and dinner dessert, we could have ate that first, right? <laughs> Good. So like Todd mentioned, there's this nice shiny car out there. There's some TVs back here and we have some other gifts that are gonna be uh, drawn for. You guys all wore your lucky shirts and shoes and socks and all that sort of thing, right? Good. Okay, next up, I have the privilege to introduce someone Someone with passion. This would be the co-owner, head coach, and CEO of the Pittsburgh Passion women's football team, Teresa Kahn. Up. Good evening. Um, thank you, and I really appreciate being invited here tonight to share. I might have brought that down a little too much. I apologize. Much better? Okay. Um, first, I want to thank the, uh, the Herald Standard for what you're doing for these young folks out here putting on this program. There's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes that many of you that are young and sitting in those chairs right now and feeling pretty good about you know how you're going through school with a scholar athlete that's fabulous but um there's also a lot of people around you probably the people sitting at your table uh your families your coaches the teachers the uh, sponsors the people in the room that have went above and beyond to try to make sure that you have a special night tonight so i congratulate all those people the athletes as well as their families and the coaches and everybody that uh that contributed to letting you have this night together. So congratulations to you. Um, I want to start by, I guess, telling my story, which is a very awkward thing for me to do when I feel like most of the time I try to go through life telling my students and my athletes. I was a high school teacher and a varsity coach for 16 years, and then you know coaching at the college and the professional level. Um, I like them to stay humble and kind. I, they always play those songs at our games. My DJ, I ever trained real well, but uh, I always try to share good messages. And uh, you know, if any of you are country fans, I, you might know that song. But so to stand up here and talk about my story is a little awkward. So please deal with me. But I, I guess um, you know, I was invited here tonight to hopefully say, how did you get here? How did I arrive? As starting out, I was a scholar athlete myself. Uh, graduated high school in 1982 and uh, college in 1986, and between then and now, um, have traveled a lot of roads. I've been very, very blessed to travel. 
and I realized that the paths that I've taken to arrive at, you know, getting to play professional sports and had a chance and was invited to the 1988 Olympics in uh, judo and I've got to play a national championship in three different sports, um, softball, judo, and, and um, football. And yet my favorite sport in the whole world was rugby. And so it's just been a, a very blessed road for somebody that was told in third grade when I was in a wheelchair that I wouldn't play sports. 21 years old, um, I got hurt pretty bad in college and they said never again, no more contact sports. And you know, 25 years later, I was still playing football at 44 years old. So it was um, against a lot of 21 year olds. I give all that credit to um, well, God first, of course, and, uh, and after that I just had tremendous teachers, coaches, and family support system that always let me know, you know, that there, I, I just grew up without fear because I had such a strong support system. And you don't know when those moments happen. I think when I first realized that I wasn't afraid to do anything was I was five years old, my puppy dog was the biggest, most important thing in my whole life, and I lived on a farm, both my grandparents farmed for a living, I was a country girl on a dirt road, my mom uh, still uses uh, wood to heat her house, she uses a wood burning stove, and just very, very, you know, country simple folks, and so moving to Pittsburgh was never on the radar ever, but it's funny how your path takes you and how blessed that road can be, but when I was young, my grandma did a lot of raising and of, of myself and she was very afraid of snakes and therefore she made me afraid of them we think that they were chasing us or something up the long driveway and I remember my little Boston Terrier out there barking at this big black snake and I looked and that dog was super important to me and I remember running towards something I felt like I should be running away from and scooping up my dog and running away and at that moment at five you don't realize the moment you face your fears in life what an impact it has on you. But somewhere at a young age, I became, I saw that I did something that felt good. I, you know, as proud of a little five-year-old can be of themselves. I just felt good that I did something that I faced my fear. And I even to this day, when I'm talking to the girls on the football team and we're getting ready to go play a big game, you know, there's a lot of acronyms for fear, but I know we always say, you know, um, face, uh, oh my goodness, <laughs> this is what you get when you stand in front of people. But um, face everything. Um, why am I freezing up here? This is awful. Let me just uh, try to read it, read it out loud. And rise, face everything and rise, or fear everything and run. I can't believe I had a little brain cramp there. But, you know, when you do face your fears, whether they're heading into college and facing the big exams or going away for the first time, standing on your own two feet, or whether it's on an athletic field. It's coming down to the last second. We just had one of these games on Saturday night. If anybody was out uh, at West Day or watched our game in a replay, you know, we were back and forth the whole night. It comes down to the fourth quarter, and uh, we ended up, we were down 20 to 6. We bring it back to 14 to 20. 16 seconds left on the clock. We're on fourth down. We, gotta, we have to score. We put up a bomb. The girl catches it, runs into the end zone with 16 seconds left. Now it's 2020, and um, we've had several close games, but this one was less than a week old, so it's kind of fresh in my mind. And I remember looking around, looking for the athlete that wanted to play. You know, I looked in my kicker's eyes. She's like, I got this. I'm like, you're a rookie, and you've missed your last three. But <laughs> she looked at me. I saw the confidence. I knew she wanted it. you got to want those moments. Want to, want to have an opportunity in front of you. We gave it to her. We went up 21-20. Now there's down to like 13 seconds left. We kick off, we pin them deep, and it looks like we're gonna win this thing, and they were rated number one in the nation. We were rated number three. Anyways, we kick off, we pin them, and uh, they have time for one more play. They're scrambling. Most plays are four seconds. This was like a 12 second play. Everybody left their girls deep, went to run and tackle her, and she puts up a bomb, and they win. They, the buzzer went out, they ran across, and they, and they beat us. Um, we're still first in our division. However, that was one of those defining moments where I was looking for who's going to face their fears. Like the crowd was going wild. It was a big game. It meant a lot. You find out about yourself not so much by a scoreboard or by a grade, but by what you're willing to challenge yourself with, what you will face. And so I'll kind of Back up my story in case any of you don't know, I know when I was introduced it was Pittsburgh Passion, but it's a women's full contact football team. 
Um, I never thought in my life when I was little, it wasn't a dream of mine to play football. That wasn't on the radar. Um, I love sports, but I, I went, you know, in high school we had three sports, basketball, volleyball, and softball. I played all three of them because back in the 80s, that's what you did. You were just grateful to have them. And then went on in college and found some new ones that I was like, wow, I'll, I'll try out judo and I'll try out rugby. And I fell in love with those sports. But I found that I like team sports a lot better, although judo was a lot easier for me. Um, I dated a wrestler all through high school and I was like, wow, you know, fighting a girl that weighs 90 pounds compared to a guy that weighs 145 pounds. It was something pretty easy to be successful at. And I got, um, you know, asked to go out to Colorado Springs, the Olympic Training Center. And I ended up choosing to stay with my team sports just because that was kind of my thing. I liked the, the team bonding. I liked the jersey. I liked going out there and saying we're going to work towards a common goal together. And I feel like families do that, athletes do that, companies do that. And so I found myself just really loving the life lessons through sport. I feel like they probably saved my life and kept me out of trouble. Um, I had way too much energy for a young middle school and high school girl. Um, and, and sports was really my vehicle to do something healthy with all that energy. So I, I have forever been grateful to my coaches and teachers back there because there wasn't all the medications that to put kids on and you just kind of had to hope that somebody could see that you were a pretty good kid with a lot of extra energy. And what they had meant to me over the years, I lost my dad two years ago. I've been out of school 35 years and those teachers and coaches still showed up at the funeral. So, you know, when you get that type of support system around you, I hope that you look around and are grateful to have it because they, they probably have a bigger impact on your life than you might realize. And I hope it doesn't take you 30 years to look back and realize that the opportunities, the sacrifices they've given to give you this opportunity. So after college, I uh, I'd ended up getting a degree in health and phys ed because I did believe in teaching life lessons through sport. If you think about everything that you need to know about somebody's trying to stop you, you got offense and defense. I don't care if you're talking basketball, you know, football, softball, whatever you're going to look at, you've got somebody trying to stop you from reaching your goal. And I'll just use football since it's my most recent. But you know, every play, somebody's trying to hit you and knock you down, and you're trying to score. You got two choices. You're a solution person or you're a blamer. And think about life right now in our world. There's solution people and there's blamers. It's always either somebody else's fault or there's people out there trying to make it better. I hope that when you leave here that you want to, for your own sake, be a solution person. Instead of, let's say our play doesn't work. You'll never see anybody on the Pittsburgh Passion looking at somebody and going, who missed their block? Why didn't you throw, you know, the throw was off you know, blah, 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 looking at anybody else. It's always ownership and what can we do better? How can we do it more intelligently? And if you apply that to anything you're trying for in life, I feel that you will keep trying until you have success. That's why the people that I've been introduced to in my life that most of you would probably call very successful, um, success I feel like is happiness and peace. It doesn't have to be riches and money and big houses and boats and all the best of the material things. But it's living a, a fulfilled life that feels like there's purpose. You've done something that matters. But a lot of the people that I've been around that, that have all that, I look at them and they have the same story. They're just solution people. It wasn't always easy. They didn't maybe get it the first try, the second try, the fifth try, the twelfth try. But they didn't look around and say, oh, it's, you know, my parents' fault or the coach's fault or the team's fault or the official's fault or it was the somebody else's fault. It was just people that kept going until they reached the goal. And if you do that, you'll make it to wherever you want to go. The only person that will ever put limits on yourself is when you quit trying, all right? You know, we just ran out of time the other night. And I know that people hear that all the time in games, you know, but you have to have that attitude if you are a driven person. I hope that I'm learning till you know, the day that I die, I want to go out there and, and continue to try to grow as a person to give and, and make it, it make it meaningful. So I'll take you a little bit further. I have a lot of success and in, in fun in college and I get out and I go down to North Carolina and I'm teaching in an elementary school in an Indian reservation down there for four years. Best job ever. I'm like, oh my goodness, nothing's ever going to compare. The students are like, yes ma'am, no ma'am. And it was just very 
it was just I was in my element these people were so good and so polite and so healthy and there wasn't like the bars on every corner there was churches on every corner there was recreation things and they played softball until two in the morning and it's just a lot of really fun healthy good people that were they stuck together and helped each other in times of trouble the neighbors all knew each other and I loved it and I was like my mom got sick and that's why I came back home but I thought wow I'm never going to find another job that I like as much as that and the kids all that was back when uh you know, Wind Beneath My Wings was a big, or Wind Beneath My Wings was a big song, and you know, the kids just made you feel valued. And I came up, up to Edinburgh, and I got a job at General McLean High School, and I was the varsity volleyball coach there and taught there for a long time. And I thought, this is the best job ever. These are nice people too, and they actually have money. We're not making, you know, balls, which we really did out of a mask and tape and paper. That's what we played with down there with jump ropes on the ground. That was our net. So I thought, wow, we've got equipment. We're active, and it was just a really cool place to be. And I was go cruising along in life and loving it. I was playing for a living. I was getting paid. I don't, they wouldn't have had to pay me. I love going to work. But I got paid to play, help people get healthy, and teach them how to take care of themselves, whether it was you know, in health and CPR and all the things that you learn about, life lessons that would really help change their life. And all of a sudden, somebody walks in and throws down a paper on my desk that was one of my friends, she was the athletic trainer, and her parents lived in Pittsburgh. And she had always seen me out there playing football with the kids and you know, knew that I played rugby forever. And it was tryout for the Pittsburgh Passion. I thought, I'm 38 years old and I'm 96 pounds and there's 350 people trying out and I didn't tell anybody, I didn't tell my parents, I didn't tell my friends, I told no one, I came down and tried out. And the tryout, not kidding you, we were, you know, doing sprints uphill. It really was that bad. And uh, tons and tons of girls. And somehow I got that call. I was an adult getting a call, and I think I cried when I made the team. It was ridiculous. I was, like, really excited to make the team. And it also helped me as a coach because when you're a coach, for most coaches, it really does bother picking a team. It's hard to ever tell somebody, try something else, maybe look at, you know, a different – a different avenue for your life because you all have gifts and talents so I make the team and I start making the trip I'm teaching all day I'm still coaching I'm driving three hours we're practicing outside in the snow for three hours we're practicing in Bell Vernon from Erie I drive back up to Edinburgh and Erie we're snow I do that for several years and um, they finally say to me the people that own the team they're like you know what your hearts in this the girls have elected you captain that clearly they respect you you're a big part of this team would you like to buy it? I loved my job. But God opened the door for me, and he said, you have a bigger stage. And I'm, I'm a very faith-driven person. I was like, all right. So I sold my boat, sold my home, left a job I loved, came down here, didn't realize I was spending all that money just to get a logo. Um, I've learned a lot over the years, but yeah, $50,000 for a logo that really I could have created my own for a whole lot less. Um, but I bought the team and didn't know anybody. I was a country girl and all of a sudden I'm in Pittsburgh and I'm asking people for money to support us. Nobody knows a thing about women's football wasn't, you, you might still not think it's popular, but let me tell you back then it was brand new. And a lot of people are like, uh, that, that's a man's game. You know, and I, I'm a phys ed teacher. I'm thinking sports a sport. You show me a game, you made me fall in love with the game. Why, why wouldn't we play this game? It's a great game. And um, so anyways, lo and behold, Franco Harris shows up at one of our games incognito. He's watching us play. Sees our heart. Must have reminded him of something way back in the early 70s. And he said, you guys just, just playing for love of the game. We're like, yeah. And he's like, I really like what you're doing. The next thing you know, him and I are co-owners. And... He's opening up doors for us and getting us support. And the girls are still working real hard to do this. And then, you know, the owner of the 49ers, she used to own the Penguins a long time ago and all this other stuff. And all the pieces started coming together. Things I never could have predicted, never would have. Who would think that you would get the most famous football man in all the world is going to walk up to you incognito and say, what are you doing here and how can I help? Um, if any of you know Franco, uh, you would know that that's just the kind of guy he is. He's always saying, how can I help? But the new show, Amsterdam, if any of you ever seen it, the doctor, it's always saying, how can I help? I think he stole that from Franco because every time I see him, that's what he says to everybody, and he means it. So I was blessed there, and we just started rolling 
Uh, the next thing you know, we had uh, three undefeated uh, national champions uh, championships. Uh, one in 2007 was our first one down in Nashville. Um, when there's 65 teams in the league, you know, right now you think about the NFL as 32. There were 65 teams there. We were only four years old as a team. A lot of teams had started long before Pittsburgh got a team. And things just came together. We were having success, and the city got behind us. 2014 and 15, we went back to back and halfway through 16. The longest winning uh, record in professional football before that was held by the New England Patriots at 21. We're in Canton up there at 27, uh, 27 games we won in a row. It spanned over two and a half seasons. And it really came down to we weren't the biggest, we weren't the strongest, we weren't the most talented, but we knew how to value a team. All right, if your team is your family, if your team is your friends, if your team is your relationship, you have a team at work. Here's the characteristics, here's the ingredients, I would say, if, if you wanted my two cents of what it takes to be successful. These ingredients, loyalty, integrity, respect, hard work, sacrifice. Think about your parents, think about the people that have helped you picking up to and from practices, sacrifices of things they didn't get so that you could have what you wanted, the long hours the coaches put in. All right, if you're willing to be grateful for all those sacrifices and you're willing to do that now to get where you wanna be, if you have a goal in mind, because I see a lot of very bright, talented athletes sitting around here, you've been honored, you've been selected out of all those schools You've been selected to come here and represent. You should be very, very, very proud of yourself because there's probably a lot of people that like to be sitting in your chair tonight. And here you are representing. And it didn't just happen. You studied late nights, probably on the bus, probably put in a lot of extra hours that people didn't see, training for your sport, trying to balance academics and athletics. That's not an easy job. In today's world, everybody's so busy and their schedules are so full, and yet, if you're in this room representing right now, you did that, you found a way. You're already on your winning road. You're on that path. But if you wanna keep this going so the rest of your life feels just like it does now, you're, you're being honored and, and selected because you were willing to do something that maybe other people didn't do, maybe those parties you missed or maybe those activities you missed or summer camps you missed or something you missed but here you are climbing because of a sacrifice you made so again I, I just say to you think about the team you want your friendship to work loyalty respect integrity sacrifice you want your company that you're going to own someday to work same thing you want your sports team to be successful same thing that's why we win everybody bought in who you surround yourself with matters. Who you surround yourself with matters. Get people that will buy in. Get people that know that they're gonna bring out the best in you. People are either builders or destroyers. They're either helping you get to the place you wanna go or they're telling you all the reasons why you can't get there. You want that wind beneath your wings. You want the people that believe in you. Yeah, they're gonna challenge you. They're going to ask you to do some tough stuff, but if you get something that you've earned, it's so much better than getting something for free. When you work for it and it's yours and you know you deserved it, whether it's a championship on an athletic field, whether it's an A-plus in a class, when you earn it and you know you worked for it, what that does for your will, for your inner being, that's what's going to take you somewhere in life. It's not going to be all the lucky breaks. You will attract those things that you're willing to give out. You're gonna attract, I, I know the other day this happened and my team was kind of laughing at me for telling this story. But um, I was driving along my car and this sermon comes on and this guy in it, he was a young, real young preacher and said a lot of really good things. But one part of it just kind of caught and stuck with me. It's like uh, your vibe attracts your tribe. And so I thought it stuck with me. So I was driving back down and I clicked on to hear it again, and I get home, and I always eat Dove dark chocolate. That night, I just got done telling uh, some people about what I'd heard, and I opened up my Dove dark chocolate. There's a little saying, <laughs> your, your vibe attracts your tribe. 
So I go to practice. I'm like, what are you attracted here? What are you bringing? Because this message is being kind of hammered home to me today. So maybe one of you have to hear it. What are you putting out there that you're going to attract back? What type of people do you want in your life? It's a really important question as you go into the next phase. As you head off to, to school, to college, you know, you're going to, you get to pick. Now it's on you. You're an adult. You're going to set yourself up for the next, you know, 80 plus years. I hope that you really, really think about that because I hope that you attract and continue. You already are on that path, but I hope you continue to attract really good things into your life. Um, the last thing uh, I want to leave you with here is the whole faith or fear. I was asked to contribute to a book. They were doing these things for uh, uh, local women in Pittsburgh that were entrepreneurs and all this other stuff that it had a lot of success. And they said, can each of you write a chapter? So I title mine, Faith or Fear. And faith is like the trust and confidence in someone or something that, you know, that's what faith is, the trust or confidence in someone or something. And then there's fear. And whether you're standing there on the basketball court getting ready to make the winning foul shot or you're at home plate getting ready to hit the ball or, or you're in class getting ready to take the, the final exam so that you can graduate from college, you're going to need to choose one of those. And whichever one you choose, it's probably going to be the outcome of whether or not you're successful or you fail. Everything is going to start to just face your fear, whatever that might be. Go face it. Keep going back. Might take a second, a third, a fourth try, but don't back off until you are successful. If you do that, you will be a champion. All those championships I talked about earlier, they didn't come easy. But every one, I was scared to death. I'll never do judo again the rest of my life. It was easy, but I was afraid to be out there all by myself fighting, thinking, oh my goodness, I kind of like having my team around me. I was afraid. I'm so proud that I did that because I had to face fears. When I was 16, I remember I was going skydiving. I was in col or, uh, college, I was in high school. and. I was afraid to jump out, and I kept thinking to myself, my used to, you know, I'm going way back on you, but there was an Elvis song, it was a gospel song, it was like, I've got confidence, God's going to see me through. I'm like singing this song to myself, jumping out of a plane when I'm 16, but facing it made me feel like I could do anything. Then I started rock climbing. I've climbed some pretty big places. I just can't tell you enough the feeling that happens when you face your fear. So. Hopefully, I'll leave you with two things. One is always do the right thing, and that comes back to respect, integrity, loyalty, all those things. That If you sum up all those characteristics, it usually comes down to do the right thing. How do you know if you've done the right thing? Simple. You have peace. Anytime you need a check, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Which one gives you peace? That's the right thing. And then the second one is just be fearless, all right? I was never tall, strong, all those things that you would think would take a great athlete. I was successful in my athletics because I was fearless. And if you can get that, and you can, you'll go anywhere. And the way you get it is little steps. It doesn't happen overnight. It's those little things. Face this, then face that, and then face that. The next thing you know, you're like, what's next? But it starts with a little step. You don't have to go jump out of a plane tomorrow. You can pretty much find whatever is challenging you right now and take it head on. I uh, hope that it, actually no, I'm gonna say I believe that everybody in here, you wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't have a lot of talents, a lot of wisdom. And I hope that you take that and use it for good in the world. I hope that you live a very blessed life, and I hope that you always go back and have gratitude to everybody that gave you this opportunity. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your night.
Thank you, Teresa. Very nice. Give her another hand. All right. Did everybody like ice cream? Because if you didn't, and you'd rather have cake, there's some right over here. And don't be bashful. Come on up and grab a piece. And then while you're doing that, we're going to uh, get ready to move along with our drawings. So let's take about two minutes. If you want to come up and get a piece of cake, bring it back, and we'll get organized up here. All right. Let's roll this wonderful bean footage. It's time to find out who our top three male and top three female scholar athletes are going to be by random drawing. And you'll be coming up here and you'll be sitting in these, in these seats here. When your name is drawn, you'll come up and then you'll also pull a key for a car, right? You'll be pulling a key out of this bag here. And whatever number you have in your key is the chair you'll be sitting in. Number one is down there, two, three, four, five, and six closest to me. Okay, so who gets to do the first drawing? You do. I do? Okay. okay. We're gonna be drawing. These are, these are right. girl names. Ladies first. Well, oh, geez, gotta be able to grab it here. Okay. Turn around. The names on the back. Maddie. Maddie. Flowers. Flowers? Mm -hmm. Maddie. All right. Go ahead if you want to call it. Yeah, no. if you want to call them. Oh, all right. Okay, so here's the point. Because I didn't, it said Maddie F, and I didn't know that that was. Okay. So you have to look at your numbers. All right. Okay, read the number. Read the number, Michael. Okay. Number is three, five, seven, five, six, one. It's Quentin. There you go, Quentin. Perfect. Oh, if you have your ticket. Thank you. Number one. All right. Another girl. Here we go. Ticket number five, three, five, seven, five, seven, six. Three, five, seven, five, seven, six. <laughs> Natasha. Literally my favorite part of the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Three, five, seven, five, five, six. That would be Jaden. And just remind all the six get a Okay, and here we go. Three, five, seven. Five, seven, zero. Three, five, seven, five, seven, zero. Right up front, Sydney. Thank you, Sydney. Last one here, folks, for this. Oh, this one starts with 357 also. <laughs> and we're going with 558. 357, 558. Oh, we have a lucky table there. And that is Justin. Thank you, Justin. Okay, 
So, Mike, what did these fellows win and these gals win? Well, Michael, they all won a 24-inch TV. And one of these lucky ones are going to walk out of here with a brand new car. Here we go. Come on, you guys gather in here closer. Come on, don't be bashful. This isn't church. You can step right up front. <laughs> okay. Quentin, you're going to be number one, right? Yes, sir. And I and I pronounced it right, Quentin? Yes, sir. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Do you think you won? I hope so. <laughs> How do you feel? Are you feeling it? Are you are you feeling it? Are you pretty, pretty comfortable? Yeah. Pretty confident? All right, I'll tell you what. Here, I'll even get the door for you. Come on over here. Drum roll. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> oh. Well, let's hear it for Quentin. All right, Jaden. Yes, sir. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Since he's not the winner, you are, right? <laughs> I mean, I'd hope so. Well, we all do, <laughs> except for her. She doesn't. She doesn't want it. No, no. And Justin, what? No. I do. Come on, let's give her a try. All right. Yes, sir. There you go. Oh, sure. Hang on. Did you push in the clutch? <laughs> no. Oh, you betcha. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Natasha. Hi. How are you? I'm, I'm good. You? Good. good. Are you all excited? A little bit, yeah. A little bit? Yeah. Okay. Do you have anything, to, like any person that you need to have touch the key that will give it luck or anything? No. Okay, you're just going to go for it, huh? Just go for it. All right, here you go. Oh, I thought for sure. It's got to be you then, Justin. Oh, we got to shut the door. Everybody has an equal opportunity here. Congratulations. You ready to do this? Yep. Oh, oh, all right. All right. Here we go. Are you sure you got the right one? I think you do. Come on. Get in there. Get in there. Whoa! Justin, you just won yourself a brand new car. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations Thank to you guys, too. You. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh. So, any any words that you'd like to pass on here? I mean, what does this mean to you? Um, well, I'm just surprised. I, uh, I didn't expect to win a car. <laughs> I saw you jump up and down real quick. It was quick, but I saw it. Yeah, I got super surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, I saw the face and it was priceless. Yeah. That's very good. That's very good. Okay. So all the people that are going to the Pirates games and all the people that are going up to Seven Springs and everything like that, they need to get... Justin, what's your, what's your email address? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it has my name in it, so... All right. Well, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. you bet. Thank you. You yeah. bet. Justin's mom and dad, where are they? Right here. Come on up. I mean, this is just like Wheel of Fortune. Now you come up and you give each other hugs and you, you got to get in the car and wave. <laughs> all right. I want to thank all of you for coming. This has been great. It's been an awesome, awesome year to be able to sit back and read about all of these students in the pages of the, of the Herald Standard. And these guys outdid themselves. And you as parents, it's so, so important, just like Teresa said, you're, you're the support group. And we hope that through the Herald Standard and the pages of the Herald Standard, that we help support these kids also. So thank you very much. And here's to next year. All right. Thanks for coming.